Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on the carnivore cure elimination diet, which helps people get to root cause healing. And oftentimes that's healing the gut. Okay. So this week is part two of the two part interview with Mary Ruddick. Make sure to check out part one. I will put it in the show notes where we talked a lot about the carnivore diet, eating liver and thyroid health and a lot of other things. In this episode, you will hear the rest of our conversation. I've come to love Mary. She's a wonderful person. Person, and she is an encyclopedia of information. Let's get right into part two. Yeah. Um, so I know uh, we're both big fans of the microbiome. Do we need fiber? Um, you know, short chain fatty acids, we know that there's some butyrate and butter, but what are your thoughts for the microbiome? Does not matter that we eat a diversity of plants for our gut microbiome? Great question. I want to dive into this so deep. Okay. <laughs> We don't need diversity for our microbiome at all, <laughs> at all. The, it, the importance is not the diversity of the microbiome, it is what's in there. So when I go to groups that eat four foods, right, as their diet, they're healthier than all of us. And they have a very non-diverse microbiome. <laughs> the, the reason why we've come to this belief that we need a diversity to be healthy is because in the States, the studies have been done on the general public. Right. And in the general public, those that are eating a processed food diet are eating basically four foods, right? Corn, soy, <laughs> we know the rest, wheat. And, and those that aren't are taking more of an active role in their health and therefore tend to be healthier. But, uh, but in traditional societies, no, not at all. We don't need that diversity. And Fiber is absolutely not needed. It's a tool that can be used, but it's not a necessary thing. We don't get sick without it. So for instance, a, a friend of mine had done, or a friend of a friend really had done the carnivore diet and had felt really good until a year in, and then had hormonal issues. And this is a female, female person, fibroids, PCOS, these kinds of things that wasn't resolving. And when they did a Dutch hormone panel, they weren't estrogen dominant, but they weren't clearing the estrogen, right? And one thing that soluble fiber, that's not insoluble, insoluble is found in like total cereal and junky stuff. It's what, what's been pushed on us our whole life. Soluble fiber, which is found in most traditional foods in non-carnivore tribes, that's in well, actually broccoli and carrots and onions and Asian mushrooms and okra and olives, all sorts of things. Anyway, uh, that will bind to excess hormones. So you can use that chicory, inulin, to bind the excess hormones and pull them out. So it can be a tool that you use, but it's not something that needs to be used or has to be used. I think you said it so well, cause I never thought of it that way, but because I know that fiber helps you to go and in certain cases, right? Not again, like the ones in our processed foods, but some of it, it will just bulk up the stool and help people to go, especially if they're having loose stools and but I never thought of it. You're right. It is a tool. So for some people, it may be a benefit to help remove some of that estrogen. I mean, some people use cholesterol because they have no other way of reducing the, the toxins in their bile. And so they're forcing it out with medication. Um, and so it, it is, it makes sense why you would then use broccoli um, and, and boiled steam to then remove some of the toxins, but then get it in so that you can help to reduce some of that estrogen. Why do you think then that people say that we need, you know, plant fiber so that we have uh, more short chain fatty acids that will feed our gut microbiome? And I think it's all a theory that doesn't work in practice. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but if I take uh, someone with a really severe uh, gut issue, whether it's severe constipation, let's take severe constipation. Fiber just makes that worse, yeah. right? You put it in and we have studies showing that too, but you see it in practice. And, and I care more about what we see in practice, but if I put fiber into that person. They're going to get way worse. <laughs> and if I put them on a carnivore diet, usually they'll, they'll start having stools. Of course, that's dependent on what their bile is doing. Right. And their, their, their fatty toxin level. But, uh, but no, I know there's a big belief right now that we need it for a short chain fatty acids, but I, I haven't found that to be true. I find uh, in the carnivore tribes, they have tons of butyric acid in my carnivore patients. They often have more butyric acid. So I haven't seen it to be necessary at all. Um, 
Uh, with some folks, if they're healthy enough, maybe we'll use something like a like a chicory or something to uh, to help with the the bile issues. But I haven't seen it needed to increase the butyric acid. Yeah, and you know the the kind of validation I've received through doing a lot of stool tests is that my carnivore clients they're they're short chain fatty acids of acetate, propionate, and they're all over the map. So there's no rhyme or reason for those short chain fatty acids. And I was just like, okay, so really there's no logic. If I were to just stack all the uh, results together, there's just no, okay, there's a trend of carnivores having higher ones or lower ones. It's really all over the place. As if I, I grabbed a sample population of just America and got their results. No, it's so true. And I think that's because our, our knowledge of the microbiome is so new, so young, right? Like we're finding out all sorts of things. Like if we were in a room together, we would be sharing our microbiome. And so with these clients that are low in butyric acid, we have to be asking ourselves, where are they getting their bacteria? How are they spending their time? Right. Who are they hanging out with? Are they going outside? Are they sleeping? Are they under lights all the time? Uh, Because lights really affect the bacteria a great deal. And so I think there's so many factors and to pin it just on fibers is a mistake that we've already made. (laughs) Or even how we use like hand sanitizers. I mean, our skin microbiome is larger than our gut microbiome. And we don't think twice about what we touch or all the hand sanitizers we've been using during this pandemic. I mean, we are washing away our first line of defense. Um, what are your thoughts with the skin microbiome? I think it's the biggest one. I, I think if I was sick again, I would work from the skin down mm-hmm. because it's something you can affect all the time. I would be coating myself with yogurt. I would be putting kimchi up my nose. <laughs> I would be doing all the things because the more and more I travel and the more communities that I go to see, They are just covered in bacteria, whether it's animal bacteria, dirt bacteria, shared familial bacteria, right? Uh, Most places I go, everyone is sleeping. A family of 10 will be sleeping in a bed the size of a twin bed. Uh, They are sharing so much bacteria. And then everyone's barefoot on dirt. And these are clean people, right? I mean, they do not smell at all. They're really they're happy and the kids are peeing while peeling potatoes, you know, and, (laughs) and handling the knife. So the, the level of of germ clearance that we have done is, is really problematic. And it makes us very prone to infections. I think if you look at some of the work, uh, the studies done on raw meat, Mm -hmm. that tells us a lot. We can kind of use that as a parallel raw meat has an immune system to it. It has probiotics on it. It has enzymes on it. As soon as it's cooked, it kills the good bacteria and the enzymes. And now if E. coli or something gets on it, it can take over very similar to our skin. And most of us have been raised using oxy and putting on lots of toxic chemicals. I don't know about you. I could not get enough of Bath and Body Works in high school. So, so, so we have just been slathered in chemicals and in our clothing. I see so many people clean up their lifestyles while they're wearing polyester. You know, they may be terrified of drinking out of plastic bottles, but they're wearing polyester <laughs> and that is plastic. Right. And so, so we have a lot going on with our skin. And, uh, and really a sign of someone who is healthy with their microbiome is not only the absence of illness, but the absence of a scent. They shouldn't have any kind of scent or skin issues. Yeah. And, and I fully agree with that. I, I get that a lot where people go carnivore and they're like, oh, I don't really need my deodorant anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing as I, so I used to be big on hand sanitizers when I was in high school, because I love the green apple and whatever from back and body <laughs> yeah. And then learning about the skin microbiome and how dirt is so good for us. And so I don't, when we go to restaurants, if my kids want to wash their hands, I don't know what's in that soap, right? I don't know if it's just better that my kids' hands are dirty. So I almost never have them wash their hands. Now maybe just rinse with water. And my husband thinks it's the grossest thing ever, but I'm like, there's a higher risk that the soap will cause more damage on their skin than if they just have natural Um, the bacteria around them and sure, maybe the bacteria around them is not as ideal, but still there's nothing negative coming in without using that soap. 
I don't know what soap they're using. I don't know if it's an antibacterial. I don't know if there's a lot of other chemicals. And so I don't know what the risk versus reward is. And so I just wait to come home and wash my hands. And my husband thinks it's the grossest thing ever. But I'm like, I am saving your microbiome by being around you. I think it's safe. I think it's safe. And you can go by how you, are you getting sick? Are you getting cold? I never get sick. Then what you're doing is right. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So, and that's what I say. I say, you know, he, he's very germaphobic and, you know, I know a lot of people are. And so he'll put everything in the fridge right away. And in the Asian tradition, they never refrigerated food. So I don't know if there was bacteria in the foods, but my mom would leave out soup um, or like kimchi that was boiled for days. And then we would just eat off it. So I thought that was very normal growing up. And so I started doing that with my husband and he's like, that is so gross because he was in the restaurant business and he's like, the temperature is going into an unsafe area. And I'm like, I did that growing up. I think I'm fine. So I continue to do that. And the ironic thing is, so we went to Korea, he got food poisoning. And I was like, see, I don't follow the restaurant rules or hand, you know, the sanitation rules of food handling. And I am the one that doesn't get sick. Yes. Then you're doing it right. You're doing it right. No, it's the same. My fiance is Greek. And when I was first living with him in Greece, he he knew how much I loved soup and, and how much I loved fish soup. Great for the thyroid. Right. And and it's a big Greek food. And so and he's a wonderful chef. So he would make me these soups. He leaves fish soup on the counter for four days. Okay. You just eat off of it and you just keep heating it up. And then you turn off the heat and then you know, and that's normal. Refrigeration is just not done. <laughs> Even in Greece and Athens of all places, uh, it's very rare for something to go into the refrigerator. So yeah, I do. I do think we're off on that. And with your travels, you know, there's so much uh, that we can do to protect ourselves from getting sick that we don't have to be germaphobes at all. I've been, obviously I was cautious in the beginning because my illness was brought on by an infection, but over the, all the years I've learned as you have, your terrain makes such a big difference. So when I travel now, I'll never forget my first trip to Bali. All of my friends got the Bali belly, every single one. <laughs> And they ate all the fruit and they ate the street food and they swam in the water. And the only things I did different was I stayed in ketosis. I didn't eat street food and I didn't swim in the fresh water or eat the fruit. That was it. And, uh, and that was it. And otherwise I ate all the stuff. I ate the fish and everything else. I swam in the ocean, but it, it makes a huge difference uh, what you do as to whether you're going to get sick or not, regardless of washing hands and, and things like that. I was curious about fish. So there's a lot of conversations in the wellness space that we shouldn't supplement with omega threes because they're all oxidized and rancid, but, and then also with fish in itself that, you know, most fish is farmed and that there are waters, even the wild versions are, you know, riddled with PFAs and mercury, and therefore you should not be eating fish. Um, What are your thoughts with that? I've seen mixed things. I've seen studies that show that the iodine in the seafood protects you from the heavy metals. And I go with that one because I think seafood is so important for us. If we, if we're by the ocean, obviously eat regionally, but, uh, but it can be so helpful. And especially for those of us who have had thyroid disease in the past, it's fantastic. And I also, but we're in a, we're in a stew of toxins and a lot of it, we can't control, <laughs> you know, we can't control, uh, 5g technology, probably 7g later. Uh, we can't control the heavy metals. We can't control the plastics outside of what we put in front of us. And so I'm such a fan of like, don't worry about it. Just take responsibility for what you're eating and what you're putting on your skin and your body is resilient. If you take care of everything else, probably going to be fine. I would say you're fine. So I I like the seafood and I I do bring it in. Of course, I'm lucky in that with my travels, I'm usually in places that fish. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about the farmed fish and all of that. But I would be if my budget could allow, I would get the non farmed fish, Uh, so many lectins in the fat of the farmed fish and all sorts of things. But I would still eat fish at a restaurant if it was farmed if it was an occasional thing. So I, I tend to go less fear based. I realize part of that's probably my Midwestern upbringing and, and some of that, but I, I like to, I don't know. I think 
we have to take this knowledge and make it to where we can still live and yes. have friends, you know, and, <laughs> and, and be relatable to people and be able to have conversations without being in a cult. Right. So, right. Yes. yeah, I mean, so, I, I came out of nutritional school thinking, okay, everything has to be pasture raised, grass finished, uh, wild and, um, eat the rainbow. And I mean, while some of those things are great, it's just not necessarily, true for optimal health, right? So for example, my mom, um, they choose to eat mostly grain fed, and maybe they could have even better markers if they ate more of the grass finish. Yes, it's not as ideal for the climate. But in general, they're healing, they have reversed their metabolic disease. So I can't really say after three years, your health isn't better. So therefore, you should be eating these foods. I mean, I have to work with what they have. And then same with my clients, Um, I have to meet them where they are. So a lot of people will say, well, I can't eat this diet, because I can't afford the organ meats or the grass finished ones, or then I, I need to take the supplements and I can't take those. And I say, well, then just buy ground beef. It's very affordable and you can heal with that. So-and-so said, I can't do this. And so-and-so said, I need this. So therefore, and, and it just becomes really complicated when it's such a powerful tool, this diet that can heal so much. And then later, like you said, you can use levers and add organs or whatever else you need to, but it could be a diet that anybody can do. And just yesterday we bought, I mean, we bought some basic conventional ground beef and it was like 270 a pound. And even while market prices are going up, I mean, who cannot afford 270 a pound? I mean, that's pretty cheap. Um, no, it's really true. And, and I, I mean, I, I realize a lot of times in America, we tend to think that everyone has grocery systems like we do, but in the rest of the world, at least the places I've traveled to, the animal products are cheaper because they're, you already own them. It's just chickens in your yard. And so it's, it's very easy or goats or fish in the, in the water. But in America, I've seen, I guess what I do, and maybe I think we're very similar. Uh, what I do is I start someone where they can afford. And also I try to make it as easy as possible. So if it's the fathead approach, you know, the, the wonderful comedian who did the fathead documentary at uh, oh. McDonald's, who I, I thought that was great. It was just Smart. so great yeah. um, because he, he really showed like you can even get better at McDonald's if you eat more meat and less carbs. I, I loved that. But um, but I've seen plenty of people who healed who were on food stamps and could not afford more than the worst discounted ground beef. <laughs> and, and they will heal. And so I'll start them there. And if that doesn't work, then we'll go deeper. Or if there's someone who's never done a diet before, I'm certainly not going to go into the nitty gritty right away. Because once they, once they see the change in their body, then they, they become interested, right. right? And then you go from there and you can tighten it up and tighten it up. And I find that allows so many more people who would never get into this to really change their health and, and make it more available because really perfect health is accessible to all of us, regardless of our budgets. And I'm not being naive. I, I live in third world countries, <laughs> so it is it's actually possible. <laughs> yes. Thank you for saying that. And I, we can just eat a meat-based diet. And even if they're not the highest or natural sources of it. I mean, you could still do a lot of healing and that's ideally the message I try to bring out there because when people say I can't afford to do that diet, I just don't think in context, that's always true. One thing I wanted to bring up with fish is I've just seen several clients uh, where their omega threes, when we do a little bit of blood work and their omega threes are a lot lower than their omega sixes. And it makes a difference when they start adding fish, which in the carnivore space, fish is not really applauded. They're just like, oh, you don't have to eat that. You can eat the steak and shrimp, but they don't really talk much about fish. But I think it's really important to have that balance and have the balance of fatty acids. I think it's really important. And that's where I think even if it's not the highest quality salmon, I still think it's better to have some than none, because no matter what quality grass fed beef or lamb, you will never get the amount of omega threes as you would get in fish. No, that's true because we're in a very different time than a hundred years ago. We're, we're dealing with people who have had omega-6 dominance for decades yes. and the ratio is so far off and you really can't be healthy with an imbalanced ratio of fatty acids. I had a, I had a case years ago who was doing the lifestyle stuff. I was looking at her food journal. Mm -hmm. It's like, she should be feeling better than she is. What's going on here? It took a while. 
I finally found out she was eating at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. So although the food looked good, it was drowning in canola oil. And so we tested her fatty acid balance. And of course the omega-6-3 ratio is fully off. And as soon as that was corrected, that was the thing. So yeah, the fatty acid balance can be so important (laughs) and therefore whatever you need to use to get there, I'll use it. I do use cod liver oil. I mean, I prefer if people would just eat fish liver. That's great. But uh, (laughs) but, it's a challenge. (laughs) It's a challenge. I know, but we'll do that. And I found, um, despite the the claims of rancidity, and I'm sure that is the case with many brands, I've seen it reverse so many cases of gum disease and and health conditions. So I'm more pro than, I'm not even cautious with it. I'm like, yes, go use it. Yeah. And (laughs) I'm the same. Um, I, I have clients that are like, I can't do fish. I can't do fish. And so I say, okay, well, you're going. And so I'll put them on a lower dose one in the two companies I recommend. I've, you know, called them out and said, ask for, you know, their test results. And I just, it's just unfortunate because I think fish is such a powerful food with, for example, the fat soluble vitamins in salmon is the most balanced you will find in any other food. And it's like, we're taking that off the table because of possible mercury toxicity. And it's so unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. And realistically, Metals are everywhere. <laughs> so to think that it's just in the seafood is, is quite naive. You talked about histamines and I was kind of waiting till we talked about the microbiome, but why is it that some people, and I think you uh, addressed this a little bit, but there are a lot of people where all of a sudden they eat a carnivore diet. Now they're having histamine reactions. And if they start trying to introduce certain foods, they have a high histamine response. Hmm. What's going on? The carnivore diet is actually amazing for histamine disorders. <laughs> like if I have an MCAD patient, like a really severe, lots of anaphylaxis, lifelong MCAD person walk in my door, that is where we are going. We are going to carnivore. What I think people are experiencing is the confusion. I actually don't think it's histamine that they're dealing with Okay. at all. Um, when someone has been on a restrictive diet, like, uh, restrictive meaning they're not eating a variety of foods. Okay. (laughs) Okay? So the body is very efficient or we could call it lazy efficient. Uh, It will stop producing enzymes and things to break down foods that we are not eating. So if someone has been on a carnivore diet for say six months or three months or two years, and they bring in carrots and let's say they only eat half a carrot and they just eat carrots every day, they could have a pretty big reaction to that carrot because they're not producing the amylase here in the saliva. And so when people bring things in, uh, I always have them bring it in tiny, tiny amounts for a few days to inform the body to start producing those enzymes and get it ready, right? Let it know you need that kind of stomach acid and all of those kinds of things. So, uh, So that's one aspect. But another aspect is that People go in not knowing a lot about the microbiome and how it works and and the gut lining. And there's now that it's become a buzzword, there's this perception that we know more than we do. (laughs) But those who really specialize in it will talk about how if you stop eating starch and sugars and things that can feed the, the overgrowth, you're actually going to regenerate that tissue pretty quickly, about 30 days for some people. I'm talking about the gut lining and the Philly. And when you do that, it's uh, awesome. That's ideal. We want to do that, <laughs> but it's, it's new sensitive tissue. It's like after a cut, that tissue that you have after a cut, it's very sensitive. It's not worn in. Uh, there's no, um, there's no blisters on it yet. Right. So, <laughs> so calluses would be a better thing to say. So when you bring in a food that you haven't eaten in a while, like a, a fibrous food, it can feel very rough against that and you can have a big reaction, but it's not an actual allergy that you're having. And you just need to wait another couple of weeks or so, let it, let it harden up or maybe two months. It's just not time yet. So I think a lot of what people are confusing as histamine uh, issues are not actually histamine at all. <laughs> Yeah. And I interviewed Dr. Sives and he kind of had the same uh, thought is just that if you're not eating a food for a while, your body's not (laughs) going to know what it is. And also we get used to functioning at such a high rate, you know, where we are burning fuel so cleanly and we feel good all the time. And so when we all of a sudden add a food, that's maybe not as ideal, 
in our bodies, our bodies are going to let us know that it's not happy with it. It doesn't mean that it's always a histamine response, but it's just funny because we have these buzzwords that everyone's like, it's the PUFAs, it's the, uh, it's the <laughs> microbiome. It's, you know, it's this or that. And it's just, how do you know for sure it is right? It's yeah. Just- yeah. I think, I think a big lesson in illness is to become non-reactive, right? If we can become non-reactive in this illness, then we have won. And so if we have a symptom and we make an assumption, it's the opposite, right? We're in victim mode instead. And I, <laughs> I think with the, with the reactions, oh, this is a metaphor that I've had for many years and something that I, I've really thought about. I grew up with fish tanks and I had these beautiful tropical fish tanks. And one time in college, <laughs> I came back and my friend who was taking care of the fish tanks had let it kind of get out of hand and the fish were alive, but it was, it was a mess. And so <laughs> I decided I'll set up a brand new fish tank and I wasn't a rookie. So I got it to the right pH. I did everything right. I put my fish in the new fish tank and they all died within three days. So we are not always aware of all the inflammation that we are living in and our bodies pre pre clean diet could be that dirty fish tank that we are alive in, but we're not really aware of what it's supposed to feel like. And when you go on something that brings the inflammation down and is really nourishing your cells and you're feeling good, and then you bring a bit of toxicity in there or something that your, your body's not that happy with, it's going to really tell you. And it's going to tell you loudly because now you can hear your body. Whereas before you couldn't. So I I think that can be an aspect as well. But with histamines, I find, I mean, I specialized in them for 10 years, right? And and really they weren't well known until a couple of years ago. But now I feel that they're too well known because people are assuming that histamines are bad, that they're causing problems, that uh, they can't eat certain things because they have high histamine when that's not a histamine intolerant person. And for people that aren't, intolerant of histamines, histamines are fantastic. They're what, they're what's in the smart drugs, right? Like modafinil. Uh, when people take modafinil to be smart, the reason it works is because it increases histamine in the brain. Histamine does wonderful things. It's responsible for healing a cell. We can't heal a cell without histamine. So we want histamines. And I think if we look at traditional cultures, we see a lot of very high histamine diets. We also see some very low histamine diets. So we've got the range, but, uh, but we shouldn't be afraid of histamines in general, unless it's a a very genuine problem of ours that we're working on. So what do people do when they do have, so I know one, if we're introducing, we should go slow. And I completely agree with that. But if people feel that now they're eating, let's say they have some ground beef or they have some salmon and they're having like nasal congestion, you know, all the symptoms they believe is histamines and they're having rashes and breakouts when they are even reacting to foods that are in the meat-based uh, world. What, what do you think that may be? For that, I just go cleaner. I go ribeye salt and water for that. Yeah, usually, um, usually those folks aren't going to do as well with like a lamb or a pork or those kind of things. So we'll usually go ribeye salt and water. And then once their histamines are down, then we'll bring in the other animals and fish or I'll have them like some people really only digest ground meat, meat best when they're sick. So I'll have them buy a steak and then we'll grind it and maybe we'll do something lean again, because the, the fat issue. So maybe we'll start with filet, not for very long. We don't want to get a rabbit illness, but for, you know, a few weeks just to get those histamines down. And then at the same time, we're working really hard on lifestyle things because a lot of these folks are terrified of food right? It would be like if nine times out of 10, you walked out of your door, a bucket of ice fell on your head, you would be afraid to walk out that door. (laughs) Even if you logically told yourself not to be afraid, your body would be sending off cortisol like crazy, right? And getting prepared. (laughs) The blood would be in the limbs. So so a lot of it is re-educating the brain via the limbic system to not be responsive, to feel safe, to not release cortisol, getting cortisol levels down, whether it's through eating at regular times and meditating meditating and waking and going to sleep at the same time, never taking hot showers. There's so many ways to get at histamines outside of diets. And then within the diet, we'll get it down. 
And then we'll bring in the probiotics later that downregulate histamines. There's actually wonderful probiotics that do that, specifically L Sakai, which is found in uh, Korean kimchi. I mean, it's one of the best oh, okay. that downregulates histamines. Yeah. And you would think kimchi is a high histamine food, but actually both kimchi and kefir, oh, okay. uh, both of those have wonderful antihistamine probiotics. So if you can get that person's histamines down low enough where they can tolerate those foods, they can start building up that microbiome that's going to handle histamines just fine. I love that you incorporate food and walnut, just lifestyle and just everything being really holistic, because a lot of people just think it's just the diet. I mean, I've had clients that tell me, well, everybody has stress, so I can't really reduce my stress load in my lifestyle. And my cortisol will be high from that, but I just need to fix the food. And I tell them <laughs> that they have to work on the lifestyle or, you know, people eat on the go and they're just not even aware of and getting the system in a more relaxed state while they eat. And they just like, well, I got my food in and it's yeah. the lifestyle component, the sleep, all of these things are so important. And I think we undervalue because, you know, we hear everyone's stressed, everyone has high cortisol. So we almost normalize those levels and that it's okay that we're stressed in our job or in an unhappy marriage or a relationship or friendship. And we think it's all okay. But I, I love that you focus on these things because I do think they matter. And I've seen it matter a lot matters so much. And we know it from studies. I think Dr. Carolyn Leaf has been mm -hmm. the best to like get this out in the world. But if our cortisol is high, we heal 60% less, 60% yeah. <laughs> less. Who wants to be on this journey for 60% longer, right? <laughs> Nobody. It's, it really ruins your chances of getting better. And I think, you know, we don't have in modern society, the, the rituals that we used to have in traditional societies. And one thing that illness is, is an, it's an invitation. It's a real invitation for change. I saw this I was, I was a nanny a long time ago and I saw this cartoon about a caterpillar and he had friends and he ate the leaves and it was a really adorable cartoon. And then at the end of the cartoon, he turns into a butterfly and he's so sad because he can't eat with his friends anymore and now he's up in the sky and his, his whole life fully changes. And I think when, when we're looking at doing something as Herculean as reversing an incurable illness, we have to be willing to sacrifice anything anything. And that very well might be our internal dialogue, our approach to life, our career, uh, where we're living, whatever it might be. I, I strongly believe that we can heal in any environment, that we don't have to move. Yes. But if you're called to, do it. <laughs> like make the change because this is your opportunity to become a completely different person and a person that isn't stressed and is happy. And if we can get someone happy right now, their immune system, their whole body is right. going to work in a completely different way. It, it just makes it easier. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you brought up that cortisol, if it's higher in you, your risk, your um, healing takes 60% longer. If you think about when we are eating foods and we are worried that the food will make us sick. And we have that thought in our head of, Oh, I know I, I need to eat, but I know this food is going to make me sick already. Our cortisol is high. And then the, it's like, it's a um, self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I always tell my clients, if I have them take gut supports or certain foods. I, I say, if you don't change your mindset, it will, you'll never heal. If I'm like your 10th coach that you're working with and you're like, okay, I've worked with everyone. And I don't know, I might as well try you. <laughs> like, it's not going to work if you focus that way. And I talk about a story all the time. There was where people were trying to see if they can fix um, the knee. And one of the populations or one of the sample was they just cut up the knee and they didn't do anything. They just um, cut it open and then they sewed it back up. The second group, they scalpeled some of the knee and they removed some of the stuff. And then the other one, they used some medication and they injected it. All three had the same exact results. And that's the effect of the placebo. And, and it's just the belief system, right? Our mind and how we can manifest things in our bodies. And so when we become scared of food or we become scared, or we believe that we are the one that will never heal, there's a lot of like trauma work that we need to work on. And why I talk a lot about, we have to work on the mental health. It is not just the food. 
Completely, 100%. I was obsessed with these kind of stories when I was bedbound because it was so fascinating. It was yes. like, well, if they can do it, then I can do it. And okay, what do I have to give up? Like, do I need to forgive someone? Do I need to forgive myself? Like, do I need to make myself feel safe at all times? Done. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, so that's what I really did. And I strongly believe I wouldn't have healed had I not done that. Because when you're in a condition with as much pain as I had, you're constantly in stress, right? So you have to combat it with a non-normal human approach of being calm and feeling safe. And for the histamine clients in particular, because they have this Pavlovian response, logical response with food and supplements and things like that, it's ever more important that they feel very, very safe when they're trying a food or a supplement. And also why it's so important to use the brain to your advantage instead of your disadvantage. You're right. When someone has been to so many practitioners, what I will often hear is either they don't do something long enough. Uh, they throw in the towel at like three months because their intuition said that they should, <laughs> or uh, they won't actually give up the stress. It, it's like their brain is addicted to it. Uh, typically, they won't be able to meditate. Uh, they won't be able to be present. And I think one thing, no matter what your religion or beliefs are, we heal right now. The future doesn't really exist. So we want to get to that feeling of perfect health right now, despite the illness. And if we can do that, then we can put out all these wonderful chemicals. And the, the placebo studies have shown that. So why aren't we using it? Why not use it? Like, I would love for this to become the direction while we're doing the dietary things, while we're changing the lifestyle. I think the three are so very important. Read a study a while ago where um, watching an orchestra play versus just imagining the music in the head, um, your mind, the brain lights up in the same exact way, meaning that your brain doesn't know if you're watching something or if it's perceived. And if that is true, and even if that is true, then believe that your body is healing and manifest it. And that's where I think, I know it sounds so woo woo, but I mean, our brains, we utilize such a small percentage of it. We can make things happen. We will things to happen. And I think that's where diet is absolutely important because if your diet's not right, then you'll be in a mental fog and you don't even have the capacity to think of these things. But then we have to also do the hard work, the mental part where it's, I am going to get better. And you'll focusing on these positives, because I feel like that's the last piece where certain individuals that I work with, they don't get better compared to my other ones that are like, I'm all in whatever you say, I'm going to work my hardest because I am going to beat this. You can tell the difference actually. And it's in the way they speak. Oh, it's totally. if, they, if, it's when they speak, if there's, um, Oh, this is killing me. If they're catastrophizing, yes. if they're saying I'm frustrated, you know, they're not in the right mindset. They're, they're pumping out stress chemicals all the time. It's not the champion mindset. I think we can all look at people who have healed from impossible conditions. Let's say like paralyzations right. and they end up walking. They never were telling everyone their soft story. They were never saying, oh, I'm paralyzed. I'll never walk again. And da, 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 da. no, they were like, don't even talk to me about it. I am walking right now. <laughs> right. right. It's this confidence and this um, this faith, I guess you would say, without hope. Right. Hope is a bit dangerous, but faith that it's already happened. It's happening. It gets you to do the hard work to where when things are counterintuitive, when you're not feeling well, you still are putting one foot in front of the other because you're not looking for the instant result. And, and those are the folks that it doesn't matter what they have. They get better. Yeah. What do you think the relationship is with the nervous system and mental health? And I know you work with um, autism. I mean, how much can we really heal with diet and lifestyle changes? I think we can go full on it. Uh, yeah, I really think it can be full. I mean, the nervous system rebuilds every six months and with things like autism, 
if you get children before five years old, you can you can nail that <laughs> pretty well, really pretty well. And after that, you've got a great chance. Uh, it depends how much you put in and how long you put in that effort. But for mental health conditions, we've just seen remarkable things. You know, I mean, the carnivore diet where it was known for was with schizophrenia for so many years, so many hundreds of years, really. And we've seen it work for so many conditions. I think the one condition I haven't seen improvement with, and it has nothing to do with the diets of the nervous system, is in uh, personality disorders, uh, like borderline personality disorders. But that that's a very different story. That's not biochemical. <laughs> there's, uh, there's no responsibility taken in that condition. So they're not going to do this work for, for the amount of time that is needed. But you know, when I go and see traditional uh, communities, one thing that's completely absent is any kind of mental disorder. And I mean, even on the menu today, there's no insomnia, there's no melancholy, there's no anxiety, there's no um, introversion. There's no introversion, which I find so fascinating. So, uh, so you know, I'm sure you've probably seen the same thing, but I've found unless it's something like taste facts, which I haven't had the chance to work with, but, but you're really born with, I think you have a real good chance of reversing these conditions. And sometimes it's an issue of doing amino acid therapy. Uh, sometimes it's an issue of, of really changing your mindset along with balancing your blood sugar and providing yourself with cholesterol so that you can make the feel good hormones. But, um, but I haven't seen them difficult. Yeah, I would say that the same, I think a lot of people, even if they don't lose weight on a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet, one thing they'll often say is that their mental health is greatly improved and they're not working with anyone or they're not using these, um, multiple levers. They're just eating the way they want to, and still their mental health improves a lot. So I would, you know, completely agree with you. You've talked so much about these traditional diets, um, wanted to pick your brain a little bit about, um, the blue zones. I think the blue zones were created by a man very well intentioned who didn't have an eye for nutrition. He was a journalist. It worked for National Geographic. And there's a lot of minute that can get missed. And then you, you make some assumptions, just like with those studies we were talking about. So, for instance, I'm about to go to the Costa Rican blue zone. And there, there's no doubt they've been eating maize for a long time. They're not a carnivore group. But an easy way to find out what someone is eating uh, is through archaeological studies and also through cooking fats. You'll notice if you read about the Aztec diet or the Blue Zone diet in Costa Rica, no one is talking about what they're cooking with. If you go and you ask anyone from that region, they'll tell you pork lard. <laughs> so if they're eating pork lard, we know they're eating nose to tail. There is no society that doesn't do that. So, so a lot of what I'm doing is going and just showing people what this is actually like. The, the blue zone in Greece is, uh, it was so off base, I can't even tell you. I mean, I really expected it to be a lot of beans and things. I, I live in Greece and I know they eat beans. <laughs> so I wasn't going there to deny anything. I was going there more out of curiosity. And what I found was shocking because it was so nose to tail. They were all hunting and killing animals and eating animals and making cheese every day and fishing. And I didn't see beans the whole time. <laughs> You know, so and I was there for a long time and I have friends from there. Um, and, uh, and it was fascinating. And we interviewed so many people and I, I just am not a video editor. And one day I will stop working so much and I can cut up all this footage for you all. But we have so many interviews with people discussing their diet and it's, it's really quite dissimilar. And I, I don't think it was intentional. I think there was cognitive dissonance. For instance, in the, in the blue zone study in Greece, on the island of Ikaria, they didn't ask them about their staple foods. See, each of these islands and really any traditional culture, they tend to eat exactly what is there. So within a mile, they don't tend to import, maybe trading with salt, things like that, but otherwise they don't import. On this island, it's very rocky. It's not the kind of islands where you can have cattle. So if you have goats and sheep, and they have fish, of course, and chickens. And that's primarily what they eat. And so on the study that they handed everyone, it asked about red meat, which in the Greek language is only beef. Oh, <laughs> it's only beef. So there, there was also a language barrier uh, that happened with that one. But they didn't ask about dairy. 
which is a huge portion of their diet. They eat a block of cheese before every meal, each person. So, so there were just some, some things that were missed. And, and I say that I want to really say, I'm not denying that they eat plants in Ikaria. Of course they do. They eat seasonally <laughs> and they eat fruit in season. It's, it's August. If you go, you'll see people eating figs that is done. If you go in December, it's a very different story. It's much closer to carnivore or gaps. You'll see some root vegetables like carrots being eaten, that kind of thing. So Costa Rica would be the one where I would say the most carbs are most likely eaten, but, uh, but what they're missing is the pork. <laughs> and that's a, that's a significant part of their diet. And the fat is a significant part of the, uh, the vitamin intake, right? And, and it's important to remember too, they're not eating all these superfoods. The superfoods aren't really eaten in these cultures. They're eating foods that are like, we'll, we'll find out for sure. But you know, they're, they're going through the processes to remove the toxins along with this. So, so all of that is missed. Now, I spent some time in Japan and with my friends who are Okinawan, they all talk about the pork that they eat a lot and the fish. So I, I don't think that's as vegetarian either. However, I haven't documented that yet. But one thing I think we can always say with these blue zone areas is that there's just as many areas right next to them that, uh, that live just as long. If you travel through any Greek village, to be honest, all the tombstones are just as old. <laughs> it's a, it's a thing. And uh, and if you go to other regions like Hong Kong, which is the highest protein consumption in the world, they, they have the longest lifespan. So we can't make these assumptions. I think, I think there's no doubt humans can live on very different diets, right? We can be on the Hong Kong diet, which by the way, is so unique because they were not part of communist China and part of communist China was getting rid of the traditional medicine. So there is some very interesting stuff in Hong Kong that we do not know and that I am hoping to tap into as soon as China opens its boundaries. But uh, but uh, it's, it's too small of, of a scope and a take on those regions. And it's really missing the preparation methods, the fats that are used, the local animals. And, and often that's from poor question asking. Why do you think that blue zone and these Mediterranean vegan vegetarian diets, why do you think they get so much more airplay than these other tribes that actually eat other food? I think because it seems more reasonable. It's, it's reasonable that if we eat a salad, we'll be healthy and, <laughs> and it's uh, less foreign. Many of us weren't raised on, I mean, I don't know about you. I was, I never saw a bone in my meat until I was in my twenties. <laughs> I certainly wasn't eating liver. <laughs> Everything was filet. So, so it's very foreign for those of us who weren't raised like the Greeks and, and maybe your family that, you know, when you go to Greece, it's a whole fish and everyone's sucking the eyeballs and that's high class. You're doing that. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so it's very foreign for us and it's easy, but then there's also the, the emotional component. It's an easy emotional sell. It's like, Oh, well, I don't want to hurt anything. And, uh, and then there's the food companies that can sell things, right. Um, which has been the issue since really the forties. If you can sell a product, then, then it didn't come from a mile away. Yeah. And it's crazy that our school system now, because of the financials, they now consider ketchup, which is just laden with sugar. A, they consider it a vegetable. And I mean, I'd rather, you know, students eat the tomato at, rather than eat some ketchup. And it's just, it's just unfortunate. Um, it is unfortunate. My, my dad eats the whole fish and eats the eyeballs or my husband eats like the, the guts of the crab. And even my kids, as much as I, you know, feed them nose to tail, or I give them the bone broth and eat the marrow, they still get grossed out. They're like, ew, you're eating the eyeball or the guts. And it's so gross. But my husband introduces them and has them taste all those different flavors because I grew up on a lot of TV dinners and I did have steak with the bones, but in general, like that was it, that was the extent of my, and maybe some bone broth, but in general, I mean, my parents didn't eat liver as well. And so it's just interesting um, that we are so removed from our foods and we don't realize, you know, we believe whatever we hear on the news, on the TV shows. And we think that the way to eat is 
more plant-based and that's how these people are living forever. And one, I always say genetics do still play a role and we are not all Okinawans or Hatsa or whatever other tribe, but we can learn from them. And so as we're closing, you know, what are some of the greatest tips that you've learned through traveling? It's so amazing your journey and what you're doing right now. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that although genetics play a role, we we shouldn't bank on that. Yeah. Like what I what I because what I see is that in these communities, like in the the blue zone in Greece, the younger generations, the only ones that were healthy, were eating like the elderly, mm. and the rest of them were eating like us, and they were obese and they had psoriasis. They were eating lots of potatoes, which are not a native Greek food at all, and eating lots of salads and trying to lose weight because they had to lose weight. So even though the genetics is much stronger in regions, and there's no doubt about that, like I'm, I'm from a French family, we don't have diabetes, we can handle carbs. I mean, not eating carbs reversed my condition. So it's not that you have a, a full, you know, um, a free for all, but different, different cultures will handle different amounts of carbs differently based on what kind of bacteria was passed down from the mom and what you've cultivated and all of that. But I think, I think the biggest takeaway is that one, yes, we can be healthy on lots of different diets. So let's not stress about who's right and who's wrong. And instead, let's work at what is working for us right now. And if what is working for us right now is working, great, keep doing that. And if not, let's not be rigid. There are other ways to get there as well. And so it may progress. And I think uh, again, Midwestern coming out, I think the goal should be getting us to be where we are resilient, where we can eat a broad spectrum of food, but not in the beginning. If that's our goal right now, we're not going to heal. So taking that arrow, pulling it back, being on these traditional diets, whether it's the carnivore, the ketogenic, there's so many to choose from. You pick the one that's right for you, do it in the way that's right for you. And then you heal to a point where maybe two years from now, you can bring in starch, you can bring in things, you're not going to be affected negatively. And and you're resilient, you don't have to live in a bubble. And with that, cultivating all that safety because all of these cultures I travel with, they feel safe at all times. They are so relaxed and calm and satisfied. And we can trick our minds into being there now. I think that's so good. And I agree. I mean, I don't think genetics will allow us to eat all the processed foods. I mean, that's what Weston A. Price really showed us traveling. I guess I meant more of the the tolerance to carbs then, or, you know, the fact that- right. right. Yeah. And there are people that are more tolerant. I mean, I look at my family, my God, my dad can get away with anything. Like (laughs) it's actually amazing. It's some people can, and then other people are more sickly. And, uh, and so that does, that does come into play. But if, if you're on the more sickly bent, that just means, all right, you gotta, you gotta lay down those cards a bit. (laughs) more seriously. Yeah. And I always say, Hey, look, if you got sick when you're a little bit younger, you have your life in front of you to now eat a better way that can give you longevity and health for the rest of your life. So don't think of it as a negative thing. Um, and instead think of it that you will be free from the burden of getting sick in your you know, late sixties and then not knowing what to do or not wanting to get rid of certain foods that you've been eating your whole life. And then now getting stuck. So there's always a light in a story. You just have to find it and then go with it. But I just think in the world we live in, we are so stressed and not always focusing on the positive. And I think that's really important. I think what you said is, is so very true. I don't know about you. I feel so grateful that I got all of that knowledge through that illness long before I healed. I felt grateful about that because it gives you power. Right. It, it, it takes you from being a victim into someone who has a power. And I'm noticing, I don't know about you, my parents, you know, my grandparents generation all lived into the hundreds and, and late 90s, you know, like that range. My parents generation, all of their friends are dying, almost all of them. And they're in their late seventies. So, so you can see, and it, it, you know, it's become normal to be sick. So I actually think it is an incredible gift to go through this. And it's an incredible gift to be on a strict diet or on a traditional diet. These aren't strict in other regions. These are just how people eat, but, (laughs) 
but because it bolsters you against what everyone is falling victim to. And it, it gives you a bit of a superpower, not to say that you'll be impervious, right. but less likely. <laughs> and that is a, a great thing because, gosh, you and I have both dealt with illness. The listeners are probably dealing with illness now if they haven't in the past. I don't think anyone ever wants to be sick again. <laughs> You've been there. So if you learn what to do, even if you're able to advance to a more broad diet later, at least you know what to do. So if you're traveling in Bali, you can tighten the reins and, <laughs> and manipulate it so that you continue to have a great life. Thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Um, where can people find you? And are you working with uh, one-on-one clients? Thank you. So uh, I'm at enableyourhealing.com. That's my website. And you can also find me on Instagram and YouTube. I'm not a big, I'm working a lot. So I'm not going to be on social media, but I'm trying to get the information out there. Uh, what I do, I work in groups actually instead. So I, I group people either by diet or by condition and work with them that way. I did one-on-one for years and I love one-on-one. I love working with clients. I found working in small group format, uh, it's helping people with the mindset aspects of not feeling like a victim and also seeing people ahead of them on the journey. So they, they get some uh, faith that they can actually heal and also some accountability. They don't want to complain when someone else is more sick. And so it's really helpful for the mindset aspect and I'm seeing great things. So, so I'm doing groups and then I have a staff of nutritionists and dietitians that I've trained that uh, will work one-on-one for people who still prefer that. And then I have a practitioner program and gosh, all sorts of stuff. So you can just jump on there. Okay. And I'll put all of it in the links. And I think the group makes so much sense. Um, I have just been working with individuals that um, recently, a lot of them have been diagnosed with the chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And so I just am doing a group so that they can be together and go through it and not make it a complaining session, but just, you know, a session, like you said, for accountability, knowing that you're not alone. And then also knowing that when you feel down, someone else can lift you up. And so all of these things are so beneficial for groups. Yeah. I think that's so important because it's easy for us to become, uh, a therapist where someone is complaining and then they don't get better. So, so anything that lowers that is going to help the person to heal. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Couldn't recommend it more highly. (laughs) I love the little short video clips you do on that one. What is that one YouTube channel that has the soup? Oh, Captain Soup. (laughs) Yeah. The little tidbits. (laughs) Yeah. They're wonderful. So I will link to all of that. So thank you so much. And yeah, thank you again for joining me today. Thank you so much. If your listeners want a discount on Captain Soup, I can send you one. And thanks for having me. You are so cool. I am so grateful the world has you. I love what you're doing and who you are. And uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to sing your praises. Oh, thank you. You know, what's so funny when you brought up the fish story. So I used to have fish too, and I went off to college and I came back The the fish tank looked dirty. So I cleaned it all out right before I went back to college. And I think the temperature was off. I don't know what, but my mom called me and was like, all the fish die. I cried my eyes out and I'm like, I'm never getting life again. Cause I don't know how to handle them. But it's yeah. so funny. It was like the same story. It's so interesting. Yeah. You probably did it right. If you take an animal from a severe pollution to no pollution, it's actually so much of a stress yeah. that it can die. That makes yeah. sense. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed part one and two. If you did not check out part one, please make sure and check it out. We talked a lot about different nuances in the nutrition space. I hope that this information has helped you find additional lovers to find root cause healing as Mary and I are both advocates of getting to root cause. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Bye guys.